Hi, what's going on? Welcome back to Ahead of the Epi Curve in the third episode of our Epidemiology 101 series. Sorry it's been so long since the last video. AP test, State Science Olympiad. I got sick in there as well. It's been chaotic. It's been a chaotic last month, but I'm back committed to posting weekly or quicker than weekly videos and Let's get back into the series, and today we will be talking about the epidemiological triad and the chain of infection. So first, let's start with the epidemiological triad. So quickly, it's agent-host environment. And what this does is it summarizes the interaction between, obviously, the agent, the host, and the environment, and it basically encompasses how an agent connects with the thing it's going to affect the host, and how the environment in which that agent lives also influences the host and its susceptibility and influences the interaction between the agent and the host and whether that host will be infected. And so it can also be used similarly to how the chain of infection is used, which we'll get into later, in terms of identifying interventions to cut off some of these links. But it's less commonly used for that and more commonly used to identify the interactions and how an agent lives in an environment, how it comes in contact with the host. So obviously the the agent's probably the quick simplest to define. It's what's causing the disease. So it can be the microorganism that's causing it. It can be a toxin. And then that's also the one that it's very easy to identify interventions for because you just target what's ever causing the disease. The host, it can be based off of any sort of personal characteristic, age, susceptibility, immunocomparability, all those kind of interventions. And those interventions can be oftentimes very difficult to deal with because now you're dealing with society and how to create interventions within the human mind and dealing with kind of not only um, just the people. Scratch what I just said. It's just very hard to deal with interventions with people because people are just completely different things. What works for one person doesn't always work for the other person. And then also to implement it on such a wide scale is very difficult. And then the environment. And so if you think about it in terms of the chain of infection, this is comparable to reservoir. So this is where the agent lives. This is where it will come into contact with the toast most likely. Then these types of things can be like for certain things like um, more tropical diseases can cut the climate determines the range of the disease. Um, it can it's also for certain types of toxins. It can be the types of foods that it's found. It's like shellfish are very common for certain types of toxins. So maybe that environment is considered or a reservoir would be considered shellfish or aquatic foods. So now into the chain of infection. So I've talked about this a lot, but this is a bit more of an in-depth cycle that helps you look at interventions and then looking at how an agent cycles and its transmissibility from person to person. So the six steps are infectious agent, reservoir, portal of exit, mode of transmission, portal of entry, susceptible host, and infectious agent. And each of these things links to the other. So the infectious agent resides in its reservoir. Somehow the agent has to exit its reservoir through some sort of mode of transmission and enter into its host to make the host sick. And then the host then continues cycle transmissibility by then acting as a reservoir. The agent exits the host and then goes and infects another host. And it's a cycle. As you can see, there's no breakage of the link between susceptible host and infectious agent. It keeps on running. So the first link that we'll talk about, technically you can start it at susceptible host. The chain infection can start anywhere. We'll start at, at infectious agent because I find it simplest to do so. So infectious agent is what we talked about in our last video, those types of pathogens. So bacteria, virus, pi- prion, parasites, and fungi. And so for this, this is these are the actual things that are causing the disease. So right now, pause the video and name as many infectious agents from as many of these categories as possible. And when you're ready to hear some examples of each, click play. Okay, hopefully you came up with at least two examples of each. And I'll give you some examples for, just off the top of my head, for bacteria, you could do 
bacillus anthracis or Escherichia coli. Viruses could be coronavirus or Ebola virus. Prions could be, mm, I'm not really sure what the actual name of the prions that cause prion diseases, but there's the Christopher Yaka prion and the Kuru prion. Parasites, um, pl there's the Plasmodium parasites and Nagleria fowleri. And fungi, there's Tinea pedis and, um, ooh, I'm actually blinking on another fungi one. Ooh, I'll come back with another fungi one. I kind of blanking on them. I know fungi diseases. There's ergotism, Dutch elm disease. Um, yeah, ringworm. Yeah, I am kind of blanking. Oh, yeast. Candida albicans, yeast infections. That works. So reservoir. So reservoir is when an infectious agent normally lives, where it can multiply and grow. And this is a very, very important step for the introduction of a disease into the human population. It's got to find a way to get from its natural source and into society to where humans can then spread it amongst each other. So examples of reservoirs can be humans. Humans are reservoirs once that a disease has entered into society. They're infectious hosts. Um, animals are often reservoirs. So we know pigs for swine flu, bird for bird flu. Um, it's hypothesized that coronavirus could have a reservoir in bats, um, HIV, it has hypothesized a reservoir in monkeys. Um, and then the environment also can act as a reservoir. So a lot of diseases like cholera or giardia have a reservoir of water. And so as I've marked down at, on this last bullet point, cholera is a disease transmitted through infected water and causes GI disease. Based on this is what is cholera is more like, most likely reservoir. So I've given you water. Can you think of another reservoir? For cholera. So I'll pause the video and see if you can come up with another reservoir for cholera. So another reservoir for cholera could be its infected host because cholera does have the ability to, trans to, to be transmitted from person to person and therefore humans can act as a reservoir of cholera. The portal of exit. So how the agent exits the reservoir or the host. So as we said before, they can be the same. And so this varies greatly by the disease and also by the mode of the tra mode of transmission of the disease. So in general, when you're talking about portal of exit, most orifices, so openings to the body, can be portals of exit. And there can also be other things. Um, excretions are often portals of portals of exits. Um, we said orifices, ears, eyes, nose, mouth. Those are the common ones. Um, if you're using if drug users needles, this blood can be a portal of exit through um, mechanical mechanical um, devices. And so the portal of exit often is the generally the body part through which the agent exits through. Now the mode of, mode of transmission, this is where you get into more defined categories. which it's, it's how it's the means by which, the agent is spread from one host to the next. And it's classified into broadly two categories, direct and indirect. And then in each of those categories, there are different subcategories. So under direct, there's direct contact, which is what you traditionally think. I'm sick, I cough, I shake your hand, and now you get sick, or stuff like that. And then droplet. And so this is the traditional, I cough in your face and now you get sick. And these big droplets that come out of, out from your lungs and then infect someone else. Now, indirect is doesn't can is still. Um, I wouldn't want to use the word deliberate because it's not on purpose. It can still be because of an interaction with people. There's just some sort of intermediary in between, or it's not as direct as direct would be. So airborne. So that's defined as droplets less than five micrometers. So that's what UM stands for. So these are con this is commonly like when you sneeze, those very, very small particles that just hang in the air for a long amount of time, and these can spread far and wide. Vector-borne, the transmission of a disease through an animal, an animal intermediary that, do and importantly, does not end up with symptoms or does not contract the disease. And vehicle-borne, which, is which is, can be thought of as food or water, 
um, an inanimate object transmitting disease. So based off of that, I think it's fairly clear, but indirect transmission does have a greater chance of spreading disease just because it can reach much more people and it doesn't require to, to necessarily be close to the person that you're infecting, especially with airborne. And this is why diseases like measles are so infectious because of their ability to be translate, transmitted through airborne and be able to stay in the air for so long and travel so far. So the portal of entry, very similar to the portal of exit, it's where an agent enters the host. Um, a lot of this same port, a lot of portal of exits also also are portal of entry. So take for example, the influenza. A portal of entry for influenza could be the nose. A portal of exit for influenza could also be the nose. So oftentimes the portal of exit and the portal of entry for a disease can be one and the same. And then finally, the last link of the chain of infection, the susceptible host. And so this is where everything culminates into really determining is this person, once they come in contact with this agent, going to get sick or not. And so many factors determine susceptibility, genes, age, gender, race, nutrition. Um, the, all those things can, de can be can determine if someone's susceptible. So this isn't also this also doesn't doesn't just relate to infectious disease, susceptible host. Race, for example, being Asian makes you much more likely to be lactose intolerant. And so being Asian is a risk factor. It makes you susceptible for lactose intolerance. Genes for cystic fibrosis or genes also, if you have sickle cell anemia, can make you more resistant to malaria. Uh, as you get older, your immune system does weaken. It makes you more susceptible to certain diseases. And then there's being immunocompromised, which makes you more at risk for adverse outcomes and getting contracting disease as a whole. So what is the susceptible population for COVID? As of right now, your most susceptible population is probably your unvaccinated, po unvaccinated elderly population. Now, while everyone still can contract COVID, that is going to be your far more at risk population. So if you were to ask her to find a susceptible population, that would be your population. For certain diseases, anybody can get it, but when you're asked to identify your susceptible population, you're normally targeting your most, you're normally being asked what's your most at risk disease. So how do we stop the spread of disease? We have to break one of the chains. If you break a chain link in the cycle, the cycle breaks and just falls into a line and the flow of disease stops. And so that's what the job of epidemiologists are, is to find out how you can break those chain links and then to enact Enact, um, enact steps to break those chains. So that brings us to the end of today's video. Um, I hope you enjoyed today's video. And then in the next video, we will move on to the next topic, which is disease surveillance. Um, if you haven't already, please watch last um, the last video about um, different pathogens. It'll help clarify a lot of the concepts in this video especially regarding to infectious agent and then a lot of the transmissibility uh, topics. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Again, sorry for being out for over a month. Just got really, really busy. I will not be taking another break like that. And see you next time.